And how would you personally define your guys' sort of architectural design style? Mm -hmm. I think that it, um, I think that there's certain people that I love and follow and they have this, um, a certain style and they just keep honing it and honing it and honing it. And they, they keep making it more refined. I find right now that, um, you know, um, I don't know, I get, I get swayed still. Uh, I, I like to, to touch and you know what I mean? I like to eat a lot yeah. of different things. So I, I think that it changes, you know, a lot of times when I'm looking at a house com being completed right now, I'm like, oh, well, like I've moved on from that. And like, I'm on this whole new style. It feels like dated to me. Um, so right now, I don't know if there's this style that I've like just really zoned in on. I think it's really across the board. It keeps changing. Um, just kind of what I'm into at the time. So one one thing that I had read about you is that Zane strips away bells and whistles and instead designs with clean yet funky lines and functional yet ground baking foundations. Can you kind of expound on that and explain to me like, what it what funky lines means exactly and what a functional yet groundbreaking foundation means. Oh, okay. So yeah, I think that there, I guess that outside looking in, that even if the architectural styles are different in some of the things that we're doing, there are some common threads that you'll see with our products. And so I just want them always to be a little bit different or off. And I think when they're talking about the bells and whistles, I really think that we're trying to get to the point where we're just really stripping a lot of the excess away. Um, on some of our projects right now, um, you know, so you find excess. Yeah, I think that quote we were discussing, um, you know, outlets and everything at the time we were discussing, you know, if you were to go in your apartment or condo right now, there are, you know, code requires you to have an outlet every eight feet. And they're two gang. And, you know, and I just I, I'm questioning some of those things and the switch plate covers is and who's, you know, walking down their hallway and plugging vacuums and things in these days. And so I think that I'm trying to strip a lot of that stuff away. So that's what we're referring to in that comment that, you know, we're trying to put single gang outlets in and we're trying to get rid of the ugly switch plate covers. And we will either, depending on the style of the house, we will take little things like that and upgrade it to a brass or a decorative fixture, or we'll get rid of it and we'll do drywall inlays these days. So I think same thing, whether it's a can light or AC vents, all of just the little things, it either needs to be refined and elevated in the material selection or the, what we call the trims and the new uh, composite materials, we're just getting rid of all together and we're cleaning all those things up. So I, I think that's what I was referring to there. Yeah. When you say trends and obviously your style is so fluid that you kind of like change with whatever you know you're kind of feeling and probably whatever your your client's feeling is it something that you guys look at trends and almost try to stay ahead of them or do they help you define what your current style is going to be or do you just not really like pay that much attention to what is trendy yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I think that I pay attention to where if I see something, I, I really like it. And I, 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 so it would be ahead. Of, I, I definitely want to stay ahead of the trend. Um, I think that's hard to sell a client on because they're not used to seeing it. So where you struggle with staying ahead of the trend is most of the times your clients are coming to you for a project that they've seen and they want you to do it again. Um, and again, it gets back to my initial conversation or comment that, you know, there's so many people that are really good at, you know, whether it's a Spanish mat or a brick or, you know, traditional, where they're good and they keep refining that. And for me, if somebody comes to me, a lot of times I've moved on from what they've seen and I don't want to go build that again. Yeah. And so staying ahead of the trend is hard at times because it's hard to put the pretty picture down in front of them. You have in your mind where you want it to go but people are visual, they visualize things. And so there's not a lot of resources to, to go to or to present when you're trying to stay ahead of it. And so a lot of times also being ahead of the trend, you don't like it, right? You know, it takes a little time. I, I often compare it. Um, I try to tell my clients it's like a car when you pass the new BMW on the road and it's got the new big grill, you don't like it the first four or five, eight times you pass it on the road. And after three or four months, you realize how outdated the other one was and that you like it. And so I think that I, um, I use that a lot of times with design with our clients too. So they come to you and they love you and then you present these things and they, they have a hard time grabbing it sometimes. Um, so yeah. it takes 
time to sink in. And I tell my clients, it's okay. You may struggle with it right now. Um, and it's okay if you don't look at it and fall in love right away. Yeah. Is that a tough conversation? I can imagine that occasionally you might get pushed back. Well, like, sure. oh, I know what I love or something like that. Is there a way to talk them down from that kind of thing? Sure. And I think if that all just gets down to your client relations, how old are they? How well do you know? Them? Where are you in the process of how much they trust you? Um, and so there are clients that come to you and be like, well, I don't get it yet, but I absolutely trust you. So it's fine. And then you have clients that are a little bit more timid and scared and, and you lay things out and, and you build that trust with them as you go. And so you'll keep some of that stuff in your back pocket until the time's right to strike. So um, I, I think that's just a completely, it depends on your client's personality and how they're clicking with you and where they are in the process and how you do that. Well, on that point of client personality, it almost sounds like you have a bit of a responsive style to where, you know, you guys get to know your clients really well and then sort of build towards their lifestyles and their habits. Um, in that conversation, you know, how, how, how do you get to know your clients so well that you feel comfortable you know, building a space that reflects them and their lifestyle? Well, if they have good taste and you see that they've got good taste, then you take their feedback and you're open to it. And if they have shitty taste, then, you know, you really don't, I don't really act, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm pretty offensive. Like I'm on the offensive there. And so again, um, if in all we have clients that are, you know, we would like to elevate their taste and it's just, everything they put down, they may be the loveliest people in the world, but what they're sending, what they're showing you, they think meets our style and it's just, it's the worst thing in the world. So again, it's, it's, a, it's where you are in that process. And again, personalities on when you can start, you know, laying some things down for them. Um, so it's not, yeah, it's not like one size fits all on how you're gonna handle the client. Yeah. Well, when you're first meeting a client, do you have like kind of an onboarding conversation with them? I mean, how deep with the questions do you go to get to know them to know whether or not you'll like their style? Or is it a matter of just like, look what you're wearing kind of thing? Yeah. Well, um, you know, Emily always, you know, my wife will tell you, yeah, like, you know, let's put some color in there, like almost like what you would wear. Um, and, you know, and so you have some clients that have saved money and really want to build a product with, with you. And so you have that and you have some clients that are repeat clients. And so, you know, I have a lot of repeat clients or repeat family members then, or you have people that saw this project and love it. And, and then you have somebody that maybe moves in from out of town that doesn't really know you yet. And you have to work up to it. Right. So it's, it, again, it's a case by case basis on, on how we're handling that. And same thing for age and where they are in their life and, and what they really want out of the project. Um, because we do commercial spaces for, for clients as well. Yeah. When thinking about, I mean, obviously your style is very fluid. So maybe what was in last year for you isn't in this year. But if you could define today's style for you, what you see as the sort of cutting edge or bleeding edge or whatever you want to call it um, of architectural design and interior design, how would you describe it? Yeah. Um, I, I, I would emulate, you're seeing a lot of the higher end guys really go back to um, what I would call, in some regards, just the real materials. So if I'm doing a project, it's real stone, real slate, real brick, Venetian plaster, and then mixing that with this sometimes a real modern um, completely composite material whether so it's not the granites and those type of things but then it's it, you know there's all these new glasses and everything that we're doing for countertops and we can do so many great things with cabinets these days even out of production cabinet manufacturers with colors and the paint quality that we can get out of it so it's really mixing a lot of those two and then again getting rid of the 900 can lights in a, in a home with, with the plastic trims and all of those things, getting yeah. rid of all of those type of things. Yeah. I noticed, obviously, you guys have a lot of huge windows and your structures. I'm yes. assuming that means it's natural light is sort of exactly what you kind of want, especially in Florida. And expensive window and door packages. Like, so for me, I, I always often say I'm a window and door package snob, and I can tell the difference between a high end window and a builder grade window. And so to me, it absolutely makes or breaks the architecture. 
And we've moved in really just to a completely different price point. We can't do it everywhere. But you get into a steel package on some of our products these days, and it's the cost of a small home. Um, but I don't think I really need to put a lot else around that. So when you use a, a really high-end window and door package, you can get rid of a lot of the other stuff that you may need to be packing into that house. And so I'd rather put the really high, back to the solid materials of the slates and the bricks in a steel window and door package. So I usually do that route if I'm doing something more modern, how thin can I make my rails? And, and, and so most of my clients or most of our products, our largest line item is our window and door package. So I definitely spend money in that, in that area. Did you start as a luxury architect designer or, or how did you get your start into this to build to where you are today, where you can kind of, you know, exert your design vision on things rather than having to listen to the client? No, I, I started for years and years and years with the worst fucking projects in the world. Uh, you know, a master bath remodel would have been a big project for me. And I slugged those out for years and years and years. So no, I did not have, uh, and, and I get a lot of people in my office asking me that too, that are younger. Yeah. You know, do I start off with the spec houses or do I start off? And I'm like, listen, I, I started off with, I, I literally had jobs to where I would install lobby doors for client, high end house clients. And you just, so yeah, it took a it took a long time to I guess quote unquote get your break. Um, I know for me, I didn't really know that I was getting it. I guess if you just were to look back, you start to see where your projects are getting bigger and you're getting more of them, and then yeah, you start to gain some traction. Yeah, and, and do you have that vision to where you you kind of wanted to move into that space and you were slowly maybe even if, though you didn't notice it subconsciously maybe you're like slowly getting jobs at move towards the price point you want or was it you know how did that happen exactly oh well i had more than a vision i had a i mean not to sound corny i had a dream or a drive i was super jealous and super envious of all those guys that were out there doing the larger products and the prettier projects um and, and i just i couldn't get my break and, and i still have that i i think that for me when um we talk about these things i'm not um ever happy or proud of really what i put in the marketplace because most of the people that um inspire me are just so far above me uh, so again if i'm traveling or if i'm looking or that's what i'm doing my free time doing it's, it's most of the time looking at uh others outside of my marketplace and what products they're putting in place and what's different yeah so when you're looking these days to sort of, you know, gather some of that inspiration, are there specific architects work that you're looking at now? Or you, I saw sure. that you gather from like Palm Springs and certain types of architecture, you know, where are you looking for your inspiration? Yeah, I think there's some super talented people up in the Hamptons right now. Um, I think you're seeing a lot of great things come out of Miami and South America. And then, and then of course, California. Um, your traditional guy, there's some traditional guys up in um, uh, the Southeast, whether it's Birmingham or, and then, you know, uh, there's a subdivision up in, uh, called Alice Beach up in the Panhandle, that I think probably more than, probably one of the most talented people in the country. So yeah, it's like, again, it's really eclectic. And so it's just what, what I'm in the mood for. I, I really, lately I'm getting ready to roll out some products that are very um, architect South American driven. So very, uh, a, a lot more, I, I hate to use the word modern, but yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I am right now. Well, what's the style coming out of South America exactly? And what, what is, what's the aesthetic of that? Oh yeah, um, you know, down there, they're using uh, a lot of glazing and some traditional materials, but you would probably, we would call it modern, um, but it's got a different vibe than, than the modern that you and I would think of out of Miami or something. It's not quite as cold. It, when you see like a, a more traditional kind of, or not traditional, but maybe like a more middle-class kind of home that's being built on a, like a production sort of scale, is there anything that you look at those homes and it just sort of really irks you? Yeah, I, 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 I think that um, packing, a lot of times if we quote unquote um, do product, when we think of production or track homes, it, it's a lot of um, busyness. And I think that they think that that is, um, makes it more elegant or appealing. So whether it's 
putting different kinds of stone and fake stone here and um, and a lot of roof lines and pitches, it drives me nuts. So, um, and same thing with floor plans, I really need something clean, lines of sight, right? Like that would, as, as you go through the front door or, or same thing on the outside too, are things lining up. Um, and then I, I'm just a stickler on the inside. I really need things to line up in symmetry. Uh, that's probably my biggest thing. Um, when you say need things to line up, could you give me an example of what you mean by that, just so I can kind of visualize it? Yeah. So if your if your roof lines on the second floor and you've got a window on the second floor and, and things on the first floor, if your if your windows aren't lining up and they're halfway in and out, and you know things like that, where it's just really not thought through, you've got to go inside and out when you're doing these. I always start with the floor plan. The floor the floor plan drives it for me first. Um, and, you know, for me, I'm not perfect, so I don't always get it on paper. Um, and I I have to walk my projects a lot, and, and I tweak my projects a lot. Um, I wish I was better on the front end of getting it all right. Obviously, the technology is helping us a ton. So we work in Revit, and that's wonderful. But I still have to walk and touch and feel my projects. Do you spend a lot of time in the design process, you know, laying it out? Than like doing a rendering and maybe seeing how it all looks together and then changing it more just because it doesn't look exactly like you thought it would kind of situation. Sure. I, you know, I think there's times where you wish you were spending more time on it and you, you get pulled in a different direction and, you know, you're trying to get it done for your client. You're trying to get it permitting. You've got things behind you and so you think, God, you know, you can start off and you, and you have a passion for it. And, and how do you stay disciplined to come back to the project? I like to drop them and come back to them. I always find mistakes. So it's funny how you can pick something up two weeks later and be like, what the hell was I thinking? Well, why didn't I catch this? So that happens to me. Um, I got to drop them and pick them back up and spend some time with them. And then it still takes, I, I think the framing stage is the most important pro process of a home. That's really where I move and change and tweak is usually during framing. Is there any place that you typically end up making changes or? Yeah, I, I always make changes during framing. So I, I will, I, I make a point of always being in town if I'm framing, framing a home. Um, yeah, so tweaking doorways or openings or shifting walls. And for me, I, everybody's got their strengths. I just, sometimes I just need to feel it. I, mean, I want to move a window or, um, so yeah, framing is the most critical point for me. Yeah. Um, and so my final line of questioning kind of comes up, um, with your guys's transparent approach to project management. Um, I'm curious, you know, what does that look like exactly between your firm and a, and a client as you're working through that stage? Like how transparent is transparent? Yeah, uh, super transparent and, and same thing. Like I will have a budget in, in right out of the gates in my client's um, budget for contingency. And they will, I don't really want to go and, I make mistakes and I want the ability to go and change things during framing and not go ask for permission. I, I will have money in there and say, you know, whatever it may be, five, 10, 15, 20 thousand dollars plus for a house to where, hey, we're going to make mistakes. I don't want to come and ask. For, it, they're more apt to let you do it if you don't have to come to them for a change. It's just something that needs to happen for the house. And a lot of people, oh, well, that costs me that much money. It really doesn't bother me. It's not worth it to where I know that it's worth it. It's just hard sometimes when you put a dollar figure on it for your client to go do it. So yeah. I leave myself latitude with my clients. And then I'm upfront about it at the beginning that I know I'm going to make changes and I just want to go do it. And they don't need to worry about the money aspect of it. When you pitch that, I'm going to make changes to the, to the layout or whatever the plans, however it may be. Um, is that something you have to get in writing? Is that something you guys just have like a verbal agreement that that's okay, that that's going to happen? Or has I it tell them that's going to happen. I tell them as you're sitting down with the budget and I say, well, here's, I got, well, when they get to the line item and you get to the line item at the bottom and they say, well, what's this 20,000 for? And you're like, well, this 20,000 is going to be because we're building a custom home. And, you know, I don't, I'm going to either make mistakes or you're going to want to make changes that I know you're going to want to make and you're going to be in there and, by that time, you're spending money and you're going to be a little bit apprehensive to go spend that money. And I'm just going to be able to turn to you and say, hey, no, no worries. We'll change it. It's not a big deal. And so you don't have to talk about money with some of these things. So I think it takes the day-to-day -day stress off 
and you always, whether it's me or a client, always want to make, there's always a change. It, there's not a house in, that's ever been built that where they weren't. So I try to have some type of slush fund where you're not having, I try to have money conversations more up front. Yeah. And have that conversation up front. It's easier to do in your office and they can buy into that. Then when you're on the job site, every time they want to do something, you're always talking about money. So I really, when I get into construction with my clients, I really don't want to talk about money. It brings it down. It changes the tone. So for as much as I can, I try to not have money issues during construction. There are harder conversations at the front end. Yeah. But if you can get past that, then construction's hard. You're not having to have hard construction problems with money conversations. It really kind of makes your life harder. As the, the project goes on, if you decide to make changes, which it, you know obviously like that, that thing will happen, do you then have to alert the client that those changes are happening or is it a matter of you can just make the changes and they get Well, if I have my slush fund and of course, you know, you can't do it for everything. But if I have that little slush fund that you're being honest with your clients, that's what it is. I can just go do it. So then the project's taking precedence over money. Yeah. Uh, now, when my slush fund ends, for me, um, the project still takes precedence over money. So my budgets have separate budgets that um, that I, I that I will pay for out of my own pocket that a lot of times my clients don't see. So if that's what it takes, that's what it's going to take. I'm always going to take the project and put it over the money aspect. Excellent. So, so you're. So I have a business. I have to make money, but I do not look at the bottom line. My project takes precedence over the client or what I what I'm putting in place, and I always believe at the end of the day I'll will be paid off for that. So yes, the what the project needs to be is more important than the, the money aspect of it. And was that a philosophy not to dig too deep into that? But even when you were younger, obviously, you probably had to make tougher decisions financial wise. But was that always a, a, the sort of thinking in your mind that that sort of the art will speak for itself? And like, that's the priority? Well, I think when you design it, it, you know, a lot of times when you have the old school designer and contractor, you have this architect that fights with the builder because they sat and the, and the designer and the architect designed this thing. Yeah. And it becomes, they're usually pushing their client or pushing the builder for that person to follow through with their vision. And, you know, the art, you know, many times we don't ever think of architects and interior designers just thinking about budgets. We always think of uh, an architect and interior designers uh, like, you know, the contractors there to execute their vision, right? And the, the money secondary, like it needs to be something beautiful. Well, I, I look at, you know, that's the way that I really view my role as well. I just also happen to be the person executing it. So if I'm with my construction team or something like that, or with subcontractors, they, they look at me like I'm crazy. But they need to remember that I'm also the one that, um, that designed it. And so it's, sometimes they don't understand that. And accounting around here sometimes doesn't understand it. And, and th there's times where it hurts, right? So I'll be in the field and I'll be like, I don't care what it costs. Like, this isn't going to fly and it's going to be what it's going to be. And, you know, a couple of weeks later, the bill comes in. And it's painful, but you have to put your head down and you have to, you, you know when it's done that you made the right decision. Yeah. Yeah, it's well, not it's not that it's this easy thing. It's easy for me there, but like, yeah, the bill comes in and, and it hurts. <laughs> oh, sure.